welcome to the China Mina podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Fulton, a senior non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council and a political scientist at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. For many people watching China in the Middle East, its relationship with Iran has been both troubling and puzzling. Troubling because Beijing's support for Iran offers a lifeline to a government that many in the region and in the U.S. see as a major threat to their interests. China and Iran signed a long-delayed comprehensive strategic partnership in March 2021, signaling closer political and economic cooperation. And during the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit in September 2021, Xi Jinping announced that the SEO would start the procedures that would bring Iran in as a full member, something Tehran has coveted since 2008. At the same time, the bilateral relationship has been puzzling because of Beijing's much deeper levels of economic and political engagement with Iran's Gulf rivals, especially Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Both of those countries also have comprehensive strategic partnerships with China, the difference being that while Iran's took five years to sign and a year later is still at the implementation stage, the other two were immediately operationalized and have resulted in very deep levels of increased engagement. How is China able to navigate this complex regional terrain while maintaining strong relationships with both sides? And just how committed are Beijing and Tehran to each other? To shed light on this, I am delighted to introduce our first guest to the podcast, Professor Anoush Atashami. Anoush is Professor of International Relations at Durham University in the UK, where he's also Director of the Sheikh Nasser al Mohammed al Saba Program in International Relations, Regional Politics, and Security. In addition to being an internationally renowned scholar on Middle East politics, Anoush has published deeply and widely on China MENA relations including How China's Rise is Changing in the Middle East, which he co-authored with Nifresh in 2020. He's also written a lot on China-Iran relations, making him the perfect guest to explain a deeply politicized and often misunderstood bilateral relationship. Anoush, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Jonathan, for inviting me, and thank you for such wonderful billing. I shall look this guy up now, given the billing you've given him. <laughs> you don't have to look him up, everybody. You're like one of the only academics who goes by a first name everywhere. You say Anoush, it's like saying LeBron to a basketball fan. Yeah, everybody knows who Anoush is when you're talking about these politics. Honest. One thing that I thought, uh, so I'm, I'm going to just ask you about your, your, your book that you, you co-authored co with Niv Haresh, uh, How China's Rise Changed in the Middle East. Um, one of the chapters that I thought was really, really, really useful for me you know, as somebody who's, who wants to learn more about this stuff, is the chapter you wrote on China and Iran. And one thing that I found incredibly useful was where you map out these different Iranian perceptions of China, you know, where you offer uh, a more complex analysis of what's going on in Iran as far as how people describe China, how they think about China. Uh, can you give us just a, a brief overview of some of the attitudes that you write about in the different factions within Iran and how they think about China? Uh, uh, gladly, Jonathan. So again, we've got to put this in, in, in somewhat of a, a kind of a broader context. And the context is that uh, Iran, even after the war, which ended it in 1988, um, in 89, beginning to re, re kind of uh, re renew its relations with its neighbors in particular, but also more generally, is, is very quickly whacked by more sanctions under the Clinton administration, where Iran is again from 93 onwards, uh, uh, who, who, who doesn't remember dual containment, which put Iran and Iraq in the same kind of, uh, noose as far as the Clinton administration was, was concerned. And it was then that President Rafsanjani in particular, but also Ayatollah Khamenei, the leader had, had already in the 1980s established a rapport with the Chinese leadership. Khamenei had been to China, Rafsanjani had been to China in the 1980s. So they had begun to understand China. And as the pressures of sanctions grew, um, as Iran felt that despite moving on from the war and its revolutionary rhetoric, it was still under a containment regime, it became much more imperative for them to find new partners. And China then was very interested in developing these partnerships, particularly around Iran's interest in nuclear energy, right? Remember, China was there on the ground in the 1990s to help mm -hmm. Iran, and it was under pressure from the West that it, in the end, withdrew. And it was then, then, that we begin to sense uh, 
um, nuanced discussions and conversations in Tehran and its corridors of power and amongst its multitude of factions about where do we go from here? The distrust of Russia was embedded in Iranian psyche. And it goes back to, if you like, the, yeah, the, goes back forever, the, right? the 1800s, 1900s, the Cold War and so on. So there is as much skepticism about Russia, strokes of a union, as there is about Britain in Iran. So they knew that they couldn't turn to Russia as a trusted partner. They wanted to develop links with Europe, European community as it was then, but Europe was unwilling or unable to dis 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 dislodge its relations with the United States. Uh, even though the Europeans resisted uh, ILSA, the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act uh, of that time that President Clinton mm -hmm. had, had brought into force, they couldn't overcome this. And it was then that Iranians had this much deeper debate about, well, who is left? Japan is not going to come to our aid. South Korea is not going to come to our aid. Right. Africa and Latin America are far too far away. India is too weak to assist us. It's China, guys. And then it is the debates that go on inside about, but we know nothing about China. How do we know that we can deal with China? China is itself a developing country. And also, it is a secular uh, country that is very skeptical about Muslims. Here we are championing the, you know, global Islam. How are we to compromise uh, around these core issues? And and these right. Debates, so this isn't a matter of you know great Silk Road, you know, historical civilizational ties. This is basically opportunism. That this is what's left, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you're beginning to look around and you're finding that you're actually don't have very many options. But right. But the key is China was by then able to supply goods and services in ways that he wasn't able to do in the 1980s because he didn't have the expertise, the resources, the foundations for becoming that kind of economy that it has become. Right. So in many ways, mm -hmm. Iran's needs at that time were beginning to be mirrored in China's growing capacity and capabilities. Right. And, and again, it's our, these are historical crossroads that the two countries have encountered that China by then is able to say, well, you know what? We can actually build you an underground system in your capital city. You know why? Because we have learned it from others and we've started doing it in our own country. So China, builds Tehran's underground metro that Rafsanjani's son had had taken charge of as a major, major, if you like, stamp of China's arrival in, in this in this area and in Iran in particular. And that was fortuitous, of course, because for Iranians, for Tehran, which has been strangled by traffic and by fumes and by congestion, to have China a country that they knew nothing about, turn up and start digging under the streets and putting in place what is now a very efficient underground system was a master stroke for both Tehran and for Beijing. And on that, you can then say a whole castle has now been built. So that's interesting because you, you see a similar pattern emerging in a lot of places where China comes in and helps with infrastructure and where a lot of people's impressions of China, you know, went back to a period when it was seen as a producer of cheap consumer goods or, or not very high quality, but, but cheap and fast. And then it starts to deliver the opposite, you know, important infrastructure and important um, products that a lot of countries need. So people start to see it in a different light. But I think in Iran, like in, a, in going back to your book, what you can see is um, it, it suddenly it's quickly becomes more complicated than that. It's not just a matter of China's bringing stuff we need. There starts to be these dialogues, you know, these competing factions within Iran, because, of course, we all know that Iran, like China, are not very monolithic in their in their narratives. They, they have a lot of different feelings or thoughts or opinions about these things. And when Iranians talk about China. I keep hearing like the whole gamut of, you know, there's, there's the pro and then there's the very anti and there doesn't seem to be a lot in between. So 
you know, within these different factions, I think what you write about is, is, you know, Iranian political leaders that are more of the reform, um, uh, persuasion or, or the more, con um, uh, conservative side both seem to look at China quite differently. And that probably has an impact or an influence on how the country, uh, relates to China politically, how they engage on, on different diplomatic issues or, or, or issues of development or COVID or whatever. So what kind of things do you see there? Well, absolutely. I think, I think it just permeates right down to yeah. the street level in society, actually. Um, when, so I'll answer you in a minute, but in terms of anecdote, uh, when, when the 25 year agreement that you alluded to at the beginning of our conversation, uh, was announced and, and mm -hmm. signed in the mirror room of the, of, of, of the palace, uh, in Tehran, um, uh, one of the, uh, cartoons was a hand coming out of mainland China with chopsticks. Right. Reaching over the map of Iran and picking it up and taking it back. Mm. And, and that was a very popular image uh, at the time when when the agreement was signed. But so but that why that resonated? That China is kind of gobbling up and and coming yeah, in it's and it's not eating the country away. And right. and and that in many ways is the essence of the different opinions amongst the elite. Also, you know, the the Tehran Public. Street. Let's call it for want of a better term, because there and and the because is important because. Going back to the post-war period, post-1945, Iran had begun to develop a national bourgeoisie, a, a, an industry of its own. When the Shah left and the bourgeoisie, the dependent bourgeoisie, as I called them, who left with him, left behind huge amounts of capacity, of right. industry, uh, based on Western investments, but also being in many ways like China was at the time, right? And and so there are vested interests even after the revolution in maintaining that degree of national industrial capacity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, an independent base. Uh, the bourgeoisie is not tied into the elite with the Islamic Republic, but nevertheless, there are those who have direct interests, for example, in Iran's car industry, in Iran's textile industry, in Iran's semi manufacturing industry, in Iran's extractive industries, who are now partly owned by the state, but they're also private sector state stakeholders in all of these. So one level, the fear is China will come in, and as is done elsewhere, people use the example of Pakistan, it'll just wipe everybody else out of its way because its sure. products are cheaper, it's, they're more accessible, and they're better marketed. And the Chinese state is behind it, right? Mm -hmm. then, the, then the other element of this is uh, amongst the factions who are suspicious, if you like, or, or, or a, bit, a bit eclectic about in their views, is ag agnostic about China, is, well, if we are so completely tied to China, we will lose what has been the, the signature of Iran's foreign policy, which is equidistance between all global powers, which is what Premier Mossadegh of the 1950s championed, right? That right. We, we, we went against the Shah because we accused him of being in the pocket of the Americans. How can we now tie ourselves so closely to the winds of China that our sails are going to be taken up by what China does and not we ourselves? It's interesting when you talked about these companies worrying about China coming into the markets, because here in, in the UAE, you know, I'll often talk to Iranians about what are your perceptions of China. And that's almost always one of the things that comes up. They're flooding us with cheap stuff that doesn't work. And we're so mad at China for giving us, you know, these, these not very good quality consumer goods. Yeah. And there seems to be actually at the popular level, quite a bit of resentment. Um, but then among the elites, I think there's different com impressions too, because some people want a deeper engagement and other people are, are, are apprehensive kind of in the way you're describing, right? Yeah. And so, so the concern is the dependencies that yeah. China relation with China can, can create and embed them into the political economy of a country like Iran. And, 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 but also Iran is in desperate need of investment in, in its manufacturing industrial base. And 
the Chinese have tried. They've, they've tried it half-heartedly. And Iranians know full well, and this was what President Rouhani was trying to get at, is once we sign a nuclear deal, we can get the Europeans back in and eventually right. the Americans will follow, right? Why? Because they trust European know-how, because they trust European companies, and because they trust that Western countries are not opaque in their relationships, that the contracts are open to due process. Uh, they don't have as many secret clauses as the ones that they have with China, for example, and that European companies compete with each other. So if they don't get what they want out of Germany, they know they can go to Italy. And if the Italians don't give it to them, they can go to France and Britain and Netherlands and so on. You know, let the hundred flowers bloom, to use a Chinese uh, phrase. With China, it is monolithic. Even the private companies in China, as you know, have to report back to Big Brother, right? So that element of competition is reduced, which reduces choice in Iran, which mm -hmm. affects price, affects efficiency, affects quality, uh, affects the long-term partnerships that Iranians do not want to be tied into, that China would like to see. Very keen right. on these long supply lines, maintain mm -hmm. these relationships. And so that debate is also very alive in terms of, look, if we don't maintain equidistance and put all our eggs or most of them Chinese basket, then we will be vulnerable to China's pressures first, because the Chinese know our back is now empty. And right. also, also we are vulnerable to what the Chinese flog us because we've got nowhere else to go for measuring the quality, the price, the efficiency and an aftercare of what we do with China. You alluded to the conservatives. So I'll just come in on that one for a minute. For them, though, for not all, not all of them, but for the factions who are now dominant around President Raisi and, and uh, Khamenei, the leader, all of these things are immaterial. These are things that should not be of concern because they look at China and increasingly Russia at the strat strategic level. So the, the comprehensive partnership agreement, Iran's membership of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, are seen by them as, as landmark activities that provide definition for Iran's engagement with China, but also multilaterally with wider Asia or wider Eurasia. Sure. So for them, this is makes sense geostrategically because it means that they can turn away from the West and the United States once and for all and not have to kowtow to America and worry about sanctions if this is now the safety valve that can remove the sanctions, which it will not, by the way, uh, from them first. But secondly, they have vested interests in dealing with China and Russia because, I alluded to this earlier, because many of the companies which are now looking for profit in a post-sanctions or even within a sanctioned Iran are those who are deeply affiliated with the state. If you're looking for a deep state, look at the Revolutionary Guard. They right. are tied into networks that are highly profitable and working with China in a non-transparent way, away from the prying eyes of the West, is, you know, heaven. So they see this as not as a problem, but as a strategic opportunity. As an opportunity, yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, you, you, you also just a few minutes ago, you referred to this asymmetry, right? Like it, it does present an opportunity, but at the same time, it does create that, that, that tremendous dependency because Iran has very few other options yeah. and China has a lot. And I think that gives China quite a lot of leverage when they're dealing with Iranian leaders. Um, does that, well, I, I want to bring that actually to, to a couple of things you just mentioned. You mentioned the, um, strategic partnership agreement, the comprehensive strategic partnership, you mentioned the SCO. Um, I think both these things are pretty interesting because both of them um, present Iran with quite a few opportunities if, you know, there's always that conditionality, you know, like the, the tremendous investment that China has to offer 
in the strategic or comprehensive strategic partnership isn't really available if Iran is going to be under sanctions forever because China's shown time and again that their relationship with the U.S. is worth more than them than the relationship with Iran. So the same thing with the SEO, um, joining that cooperation and, and, and opening up to, to Russia and India and Pakistan and all the Central Asian republics could help Iran tremendously economically. But again, if those countries aren't willing to, to, you know, uh, work against U.S. sanctions. So this seems to me that that leverage comes into play. Do you think that, that Beijing is using these, these, um, opportunities, the, the partnership and SEO as, as they're dangling in front of Tehran and saying, look, here's what you get. If you say go back to the JCPOA with the U.S. and negotiate and, and 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 change your behavior in a way that's more aligned with something that will support regional stability, not necessarily you know cooperate overtly with the U.S. but but stop threatening our interests in a very important strategic region. Do you think they're using these these opportunities as as leverage with Tehran? Oh, well, absolutely. In fact, actually, one of the arguments that the reform camp so called makes is that. If we've got deals with other countries, we can get a better deal out of China. That, you know, we can still do business with China, but let's do it on better terms. That if the Chinese know there is competition from Europe, like there was in 2016, 2017, then they're likely to give us better opportunities, better deals in dealing with them. Once they know we are isolated, well, you know, uh, they can do whatever they want. And, and the Chinese are in, on, on Shanghai Co- Cooperation Organization, Jonathan, I, I think that is something that the Chinese knew Iran wanted as validation of right. its trust in China. Rather than China dangling this in front of them as incentive, it was more Iran wanting to see evidence of China's commitment. And for China, in a sense, it doesn't come at a heavy price for Iran becoming a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, given that you know, with Russia, it's, it's already a very close relationship. And given that Iran-Indian relations are not such that would challenge China right. within the SCO. So in many ways, this was a low-hanging fruit for them. But for the Iranian elite, it's validation that, you know, we've got China as a strategic partner. Because here they are sponsoring our membership of this, what they see as the future of Asia organization. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's, it's, it's much more a kind of a mutual nod uh, in, in, in each other's direction of okay. understanding, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, again, people worry about China being in West Asia, in the Gulf and the Middle East and so on, without mentioning that China's interest is profoundly the same as the West, that this region exactly. needs to be stable, right? Exactly. That actually there is no profit for China, at least, in stability. Some say rather cynically that instability makes American arm, arms manufacturers very rich, right? For China, that's not the game that it can compete with the West in yet, in this part of the world, you right. know? Um, so stability of this region is much more important to a mercantilist China than instability of the region. And it is in that regard that Iran's behavior becomes profoundly important to China. It's not just about the Americans that, look, the Americans will always be more important to us than a regional upstart like Iran, but it's also about China's growing links with the rest of the region. You've mentioned the Emirates, you've mentioned Saudi Arabia, you know, the Chinese are building Kuwait's Silk City. They are heavily invested in Dhum, in Oman, in Oman. Yeah. Uh, offshore Indian Ocean. Uh, they, they are building a new Cairo of the 6,000 years of Egyptian civilization. They are off the coast of Mediterranean in Israel, helping Israel develop its, its facilities. They are interested in energy links between Israel, Cyprus, and, and, and Greece. They're talking to Turkey about Turkey joining the, the BRI and, and so on. You know, Iranian disruption can throw all of this apple cart in the Absolutely. air. And that really worries China. And 
JCPOA is not sufficient, but at least the start of trying to stabilize, watch it's a very unstable relationship. You know, people in Beijing would not have been happy to see ballistic missiles targeted at Abu Dhabi and fired at Abu Dhabi during the visit of the Israeli president when right. the Chinese themselves are so involved in helping the Emirates become this important hub. Well, if you've got missiles coming down on you, what kind of a reliable hub are you, for goodness sake? Right? Well, not just that, but they have between two and 300,000 Chinese citizens living in Absolutely. Dubai. Absolutely. So that's a consideration too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I think what you're what you're describing to me is is the essence of a lot of when people worry about China's presence in the Middle East as a disruptive actor. I mean, China's interests in the Middle East and especially in the Gulf are so closely aligned with America's interests in this region and stability and energy getting to global markets. All of this stuff um, link up very nicely. So you're right. I think with with the China Iran relationship, this actually provides an opportunity for a lot of Iran's rivals to to try to change its behavior in a, in a more positive way. Not too many other great powers can do that with Iran because they don't have that kind of uh, leverage or or positive relations, right? Uh, absolutely, you know, they have they have uh, to put it impolitely, they have no influence uh, yeah. with Tehran at all. Only negative, only a threat, the stick. O only, kind of uh, only stick absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's, there's no carrot. It's, right. it's the stick all, all the time. Whereas China has the carrot as well. But of course, you know, for China to, to really profit from BRI in West Asia, it needs a stable Iran. It needs a stable Iran that can smooth the path out of Afghanistan, right across Iran, through Turkey and into Europe, right? You know, we've got the southern and the northern links and so on. I mean, look at Kazakhstan right now, right? That would have worried the Chinese an enormous amount. Not that they care too much about the regime change there, but about stability of Kazakhstan. And right. it's interesting that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was not called upon to stabilize Kazakhstan, but it was the agreement with Russia that did it. From the Chinese side, that makes perfect sense because the Chinese like business and not war. They do not want to be interfering in countries' internal affairs in that way. And if 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 Iran goes belly up, that will be a huge uh, discount, if you like, for China. That will really damage China's role, given what is invested in diplomacy, but also what is promised. Iran in terms of this 25 year agreement, in terms of membership of Sanko Corporation Organization, in terms of the BRI and so on. So, you know, the Chinese will have, will have been telling them the importance of stability, the importance of getting your house in order, the importance of, okay, you can, you can, you can shout slogans at Americans, but don't fire missiles at them, you know? Right. So this, this actually is, I think this is a really important point that, that doesn't really get picked up on a lot because this 25 year agreement that is, is really, you know, massive headline generator. But we know that China and Iran initially agreed to this, um, comprehensive strategic partnership when Xi Jinping went to Tehran in January 2016. That's right. Now he had previously been to Riyadh and signed a similar agreement yeah. with the Saudis. Um, and I don't think the timing is a coincidence. He was the first head of state, I believe, to, to visit Tehran after the JCPOA. In my thinking, and this is speculative, but I think it, it holds up. This seems like China saying to Iran, look, you signed the JCPOA. Um, this is kind of a reward, right? We're showing you the path to a more yeah. normal status in the region. If you can maintain this, this deal, if you can stick to the obligations within the JCPOA, then you're going to get all this investment. You're going to get all this trade. You're going to see the relationship with China support your, your interests in development in a lot of ways. But a few months after that, the change administration in the U.S. signaled that the U.S. was going to take a harder line towards Iran and towards China. And you immediately saw China back away, you know, so the promise of this partnership just completely stalled until what was it? The summer of 20 when, you know, it looked like China was trying to create a little more influence in, in the Gulf. Uh, in terms of its relations with the U.S., and it started to, to ratchet up again. So it does seem like China's used these the, these kind of uh, incentives in the past to get Iran to change its behavior, 
or maybe to, to be a more stable regional actor. And I, I think that's kind of what we're seeing in play right now. In, and, and also sometimes to use Iran to pressure the United States. Um, and, and in some ways, Iranians are in many ways willing, willing partners in that because they go out of the way to, to pressure the United States. And for them to, for part of the elite to feel that it's actually playing an instrumental role in Chinese American relations right. is a good thing because it makes them feel relevant to China. Forget the American side to China that, you know, here they are the only country which is able to stand up to American pressure in this part of the world while the Americans are applying it in China's part of the world. So mm -hmm. if the Americans want to sail through the Straits of Taiwan, for example, well, we can, we can put a few mines out by the Strait of Hormuz, uh, for the American fleet coming out. Um, if the Americans put pressure on China in South China Sea, uh, for example, but we can sail our fleet round to Yemen, uh, as a show of force. And, and there is a, the level of symbolism, Jonathan, but there is also the other side of it is Iran's relationship with this equation seems to be confrontational. Whereas Emirates and Saudi Arabia's and Israel's and Egypt's and Turkey's relationship seems to be compromisable, right? And this is the difference in China's relations with this part of the world. This is the only one which is couched in, in a hostile triangular relationship. Mm -hmm. Whereas China with all other countries in the United States is not hostile. There is concern about Hawaii, about 5G, about infrastructure in Israel, in UAE, and, and, and maybe arms, uh, to are. Saudi Arabia and so on. There's a whole gamut of range of issues that Americans have conversations with their Arab allies and Israel. But in Iran, that's not the case. This is a tripod built on tension rather than cooperation between China, United States and Iran. And that kind of a tripod cannot be as stable as one which is mutually advantageous as the one between the Arab states and Israel, the United States and China. So long as China and United States do not see themselves as competing for these countries' patronage, which do not. The, Ameri the Chinese are not telling the Saudis or the Emiratis, stop buying weapons from the States tomorrow, thank you very much. Bahrain, kick out the Fifth Fleet from, from Manama tomorrow, thank you very much, because we are here. None of that. None right. of that. With Iran, it's not the same. And so that makes Iran very much an outlier in China's relations, growing relations and links with this part of the world. And if I was in Tehran, I would see that as a, as a warning rather yeah. than as something that I would like to cultivate and develop and deepen even more, where you build insecurity in China's calculations rather than stability and security. So that's a point you mentioned earlier about um, Tehran, or Iran and the BRI. And that's a point I keep bringing up with people because I think that China, I Iran's perceived importance in BRI is quite often exaggerated. Mm -hmm. You know, people say it provides its land link to the Gulf. Um, but what we've seen from China's BRI approach is the, the maritime routes are vastly more important. And for, to get from China to, to Iran or to get from China to the Gulf via Tehran, you've got to pass through unstable places, Tur Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, um, Kazakhstan now, um, also countries that aren't really heavily populated. You don't have big urban centers full of people and markets. Um, you know, and it goes, it's slower. You know, you're trying, you, you can't ship as much by rail. You can't, ship as much by by highway um we saw when suez was blocked you know yeah. whatever last year the maritime shipping is so important to the global economy and it's so important to bri so what iran offers china in the bri is actually quite limited compared to these port cities on the arabian peninsula so what you're describing here of, of, of this kind of vulnerability that iran must feel i think that's only amplified when you realize that china's ambitions are all about connectivity you know, we saw that when, when Qatar was isolated, a lot of China's projects there got stalled. Yeah. And a lot of their projects in the UAE and in Saudi really ramped up 
Uh, I think the reason for that, and again, speculation, but I think it's because suddenly Qatar didn't connect to as many different places as it used to. Whereas the UAE with its logistics hub and Saudi with its, you know, um, you know, its Gulf shoreline and its, its Red Sea shoreline, you know, these places were hyper connected politically, logistically, economically. And the same thing with Iran. I mean, it's a huge market. It's huge, you know, uh, uh, population, but it's also an isolated one. And for what China wants to achieve in the Middle East, you can't really benefit unless you're connected. You need to have these good relations with your neighbors. You need to be economically integrated in the region. So I think this does offer another reason for Iran to, if they want to enjoy the benefits of a China relationship, they really have to become a more of a, you know, like air quotes, uh, normal country within its own region. And, and also with all of that goes trust that, you know, if there isn't trust, amongst the neighbors between Iran and its neighbors, it'd be very mm. difficult to then create the conditions that China wants in terms of interactions. So the Chinese don't worry about suddenly Egypt and Israel uh, becoming a kinetic relationship. Uh, they can deal around the Suez area, they can deal with Egypt, they can deal with Israel and not worry about the dynamics of relationship between those two countries and so on. They don't have that degree of confidence when they're dealing with Iran, Saudi Arabia and the UAE in particular. They may be less worried when it comes to Oman and Qatar and Kuwait for, for obvious reasons. But those are not the countries that Chinese have put a lot of effort into relative to Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, where there is this real tension between Iran and, and those two countries. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that lack of trust that actually their Arab partners don't trust Iran, devalues What's China's the narrative with them about its interest in developing relations with them. Because you know, and I know that those guys in the, the elites of those countries have always got an eye on Iran, no matter oh. what, no matter what. Um, and it won't be easy for them to accept China's assurances at face value when they look at what Iran does on the ground. Right. Uh, and, and that is, that is a, that is a really difficult, uh, circle to square for, for, Absolutely. for China's, China's diplomats, uh, very much so. But on the, on the BRI though, I Iran is only part of this jigsaw. Both European Union, well, let's say Germany in particular, and China are very keen to find land route between the continents. They are very keen to reduce mm -hmm. the costs of doing trade. For Germany, which is looking at Europe's saturated markets, Asia is vital. But unfortunately, as we see every day in our relations with Russia, which sits on top of Germany's maritime links, is becoming increasingly dangerous. Right. So Germany would like to have an overland route, safe and cheap and reliable. And, and they don't want it. Yeah, they don't want it with anybody else but China, because they know the Chinese will deliver the infrastructure there. And in that puzzle, Iran is important because it straddles the Caspian Sea and the Persian Gulf. And, and so, okay, you bypass the southern waterway. But the Caspian is so important for energy routes, but also in the way that now the Caspian states, Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan are looking at each other. Yep. Yeah. You know, today, right now, 2nd of February 2022, it should be Iran that should be coming to rescue of European countries uh, to supply them gas. Iran is the second largest, second largest uh gas state in the world, right? Far bigger than what Qatar can do. Qatar has got the LNG capacity. So off the coast of Wales, we've got a LNG uh, facility owned by Qatar that brings LNG for British households mm -hmm. uh, and British industry and so on. And we sit here worrying about what if Russia does something in Ukraine, right? President Biden invites Sheikh Tamim to go to Washington 
to ask him to supply Europe with Qatar's natural gas, right? Nobody is knocking on Tehran's door and say, hey, buddy, we know you're sitting on this gas that you don't know what to do with because, right. because actually, because you know, can buy it. Uh, uh, they need somebody to show them how to turn it into LNG, put it on these ships and get it out or access to pipelines which are already emerging, Jonathan, that Iran's gas could go through Turkey uh, and, and into Europe. Somebody in Tehran should be asking, why are we not at the heart of this geopolitical crisis mm -hmm. as a savior of, of the world economy, as it were, right? And they're well, not. I think we can, see, we can see the reason why, right? Because yeah. they're, they're, yeah. they're... But you see, politics. in that regard, if there was even a symbolic BRI that allowed the building of infrastructure, brought in the resources and so on, that Iran's natural gas could be, could be exploited fully and properly, right? Even if it went to Asia, it would free up somebody else's to come to Europe. You know, we're now receiving, you know, gas from, from United States in Europe, competing with Qatar at one level to supply Europe with American fracking gas. Uh, mm -hmm. And the US became the largest producer of this just before the pandemic. Obviously, they are pushing domestic supplies in the United States to get the stuff out and shipping out to Europe because it is it is a genuine strategic consideration here now, right? And here is this huge gas state in total vacuum when all this is going on. Yeah, so I mean, I think what you're describing is is pretty consistent with the larger picture of you know the BRI and 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 China's inability or reluctance to to really engage as deeply with Iran as, as you would expect. I mean, what I've seen um, for, from years of, of looking at China Gulf relations from this side of the Gulf is, is really consistent with stories about the importance of Iran. I mean, it's consistently does a lot more business with this side. It's got a lot more expatriates living on this side. They're doing more contracting, more investment, yeah. you know, and because these countries fit into a larger pattern of, of cooperation and integration with the global economy. So it seems to me, I mean, if, if China's engagement favors the status quo states, which are largely U.S. allies or partners, um, everything you've described to me uh, over the past hour or so has been that Iran-China relations are, are vastly more complex and, and far less um, uh, synchronous as, as we often seem to hear them in the media, that there's a lot of moving parts and they're not always uh, in alignment. Um, a lot of our listeners are going to be uh, I, I assume the policy community in the U.S., given our Atlantic Council uh, production here. If you were just to, to wrap up here with a message to them, I mean, should they be as concerned about the China-Iran relationship as it's often portrayed in the media? Or do you think that this is not as um, a, a, not as concerning a bilateral relationship as, as it often is? I would make it one removed, and I would say they should be concerned about, about Iran's orientation. Uh, sure. That... that, that you know, in Jewish strategic terms, it is really important if we assume that this is the Asian century, if we assume that there are now Asian regional systems emerging and integrating and so on, and that mm -hmm. the danger Absolutely. that this could become insular and inward looking rather than global looking, that if we are pushing China and Ch China more and more uh, towards an inter introvert position, that having a country sitting you know, on the Western boundaries of Asia, hostile to the West is not a good thing because it creates its own dangerous dynamics that, that will not benefit the West's and the world's broader interests in that regard. So I would say, don't worry so much about Iranian Chinese relations in itself, worry about Iran's orientation eastwards and what that means for your interests in West Asia, in Europe, in the Caucasus, in, in, in Central Asia and in South Asia. And Iran has a paw in all of these sub theaters. Um, mm -hmm. And you do not want to reinforce the West and East edges of Asia as a hostile boundary against your interests. So that would be the message I would send. But also, 
we, I mean, you know, we've talked about China's relations with the GCC countries. And one of the key reasons why that has been so prosperous, of course, is because these countries have access to finance and right. they have finance. They invest in China as a measure of this, this integrated relationship that they have. They build the invested infrastructure in refineries, in processing plants, in banks and, and all sorts. Iran doesn't offer them that at all, at all, at all, at all. So at one level, you may worry about the growing financial links between China and your Arab allies and less so about any monetization of Chinese Iranian relations because Iran is skint. So there are two different levels of concern, Jonathan, yep. if our colleagues or friends out in Atlantic Council are going to be listening. You know, uh, that's a really great point to end on. And uh, thanks, Anoush, so much for this. This is really enlightening. I think it's it's helpful. It gave us a lot more to think about uh, when we think about these two countries. Um, for our listeners, I'm going to put links on the show page for, for some of uh, Prof. Anoush's many, 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 many books on the topic. It's a whole bookcase full of things. But I know that you have a new book um, about Iran that I think our listeners would find interesting. Before we sign out, I'll give you a chance to plug it. What's the book? Where can they find it? Oh, thank you, Jonathan, very much. Uh, it's called Defending Iran from Revolutionary Guards to Ballistic Missiles with Cambridge University Press that I've co-authored with my dear friend and colleague at National Defense University in Washington, uh, Professor uh, Gadat Bakat. It's just come out. Um, you can get it as a PDF as well, if you like. Um, we think it's a good read. It took us two and a half years to write. Um, and for once, nuclear is is a subtext rather than the core text of the book. The we are actually looking much more deeply about what is Iran's national security strategy. And we begin to to unpack what symmetrical warfare really means in terms of Iran's uh, national defense strategy. Well, my sadly, my copy hasn't arrived yet. I've ordered it and I can't wait to get my hands on it. It looks fantastic. Anoush, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I really appreciate it. It was uh, very helpful. Jonathan, it's um, been a real pleasure for me to be your, your guest and, and honored to be your first guest. So thank you very much. All I can say is that things will now improve from here on. <laughs> Inshallah. To our listeners, thank you for joining us today. Follow us on social media and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next show. Thank you. This podcast was produced by HeartCast Media.